Welcome to Unpacking the Mass with Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we dig into the week's readings for the upcoming Sunday for the Catholic Church so that when you go to Mass, you are ready to hear what God has to say to you through the Scriptures. So grab your Bibles and let's get digging. Hey friends, welcome to Unpacking the Mass. My name's Keith. I'm so thankful that you're here with us. Today we are looking at the readings for the third Sunday in Easter, and I hope you are still flying high on the Easter season. And in our readings today, in our first reading from the book of Acts, we see how this truth has changed the apostles and is changing the world, which still continues to this day. Remember, these guys didn't just go back to their regular lives once they experienced the resurrected Jesus. Their mission from God was to bring the gospel to the world. And these guys weren't equipped in and of themselves to do that. Jesus equips them. The Holy Spirit, he said, would come to them because he goes away. And we see what this looks like and how this gets played out in our first reading today. But before we dive in, let's pray together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with the truth. Allow us to see how you bring times of refreshing to each of us and how you change us and have changed the world through the truth of the gospel. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember that. Times of refreshing. We're going to talk about that. Let's look at our first reading from Acts chapter 3. And this, of course, is Peter speaking to the crowds after the apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Wow. Again, isn't it so amazing seeing Peter being so bold, the same one who had denied even knowing the Lord and then were hiding for fear of the Jews. And now that the Holy Spirit has come to fill the apostles with power, he's preaching and declaring the gospel mightily. And he doesn't hold any, anything back, does he? He doesn't pull any punches. He he looks the people in the eye and he says, you did this. And he connects Jesus to everything that they were in Pentecost to celebrate their faith. He said, this is the God that our forefathers had led us to Jesus, right? This is, this is what it was all about. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not saying, hey, this is some new thing. So oftentimes we we can look at the Old Testament or the, the Jewish religion and think that this is some foreign thing. No, friends, we are the fulfillment of this. Not we personally, but what God is doing and that we participate in that. Remember, that's, and I know it's a complicated issue. and A lot of people are talking about all this stuff right now with the Jesus is King stuff. And some people think that's anti-Semitic and people are talking about what about the old covenant versus the new covenant. I'm not here to solve all that for you. I don't think it's that complicated, really. The reality is this, the the, the Christianity, Catholicism is not a quote unquote new religion. It is the fulfillment of the only true religion, right? So what you see happening is Peter doesn't say, well, this was the past and now we're here. So everything's different. He says, this is the fulfillment of everything that you looked forward to. Now, are there a lot of things that seem different? Yeah, absolutely. Does it, does it completely function on a different level? hundred percent. But Jesus is not the God of some different group of people, friends. We as Christians have been grafted into the vine. We have become part of God's people, God's chosen people. And and what Peter is doing is he's showing these people that, look, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything you've been looking for. And you blew it because you missed out. And of course, Jesus talked a lot about this. He said, the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to a different people, given to people. So, So in essence, you have to remember, 
without the son, you don't have the father. So there, there can't be this, this weird space that some people want to live in where, where you can have like the, the Jewish religion that rejects Jesus somehow in the same parallel place as Christianity, as though they're both equally good and they're both the same thing. They're not. One is the fulfillment of the other. One brings to completion the other. And of course, the gospel, and not, and not just the gospel, but the New Testament is filled with all sorts of, of unpacking of what it means to not go back to the old way of doing things, but to move forward in the new covenant, which is what we see here and, who, and what we live into as, as, as Christians who practice the new covenant that Jesus Christ instituted in his body and blood. So we don't have like these two things that are parallel one next to each other that we kind of go, okay, you see that sometimes, especially like in, you know, evangelical Christianity, where it's almost like they, they, on one hand, they want to tell everybody, you have to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. You have to confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. But then they want to say that somehow uh, the, the, the religion of Judaism that completely denies him that, no, that's cool. No, the, the Bible says that that there's going to be a a recognition ultimately of Christ to 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 the Jewish people, right? St. Paul talks about this that that the full number of Gentiles must be brought in and the, and, the, and thus Israel will be saved. But friends, in the meantime, in the meantime, listen to what Peter says here and, and recognize that Christ has come to fulfill the law. And that doesn't mean that God's covenant has been broken. It means that it's been fulfilled and we have a new covenant. We are all children of the promise in Christ, not by virtue of our descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the flesh. No, my friends, the flesh counts for nothing. We have to remember that this is a circumcision of the heart, as St. Paul says, that through faith in Christ, now we've been grafted into this reality of becoming God's chosen people, right? Yes, that was the, the Israelites. That was the covenant he made with them. But my friends, when you depart from the Son, you depart from the Father. And, and we must be very careful that we, don't, that we don't miss that. We can't just say, well, you know, we don't need Jesus. We do need him. We do need him. And I, and I know I'm kind of getting off track here, but I think the point of that is that what we see here and what Peter is saying in this first message and what the church is teaching here is Christ is the fulfillment of all this stuff. And if you miss him, then you've missed everything that the old covenant was about anyway. So don't miss him. All right. Now, I think this is cool how he, he talks about the, the, the times of refreshing, right? This is the response to the truth of the gospel, repentance. That's what he says. Repent then and turn to God so that our, your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I love this promise of times of refreshing. What does this really mean? You know, I don't know of, of what it means completely on this globalistic perspective, but I, I do understand what it means personally to enter into those times of refreshing. Now, what does that mean? It means rest. It means a ceasing of this mindset of, I have to do all of these things to earn and, and practice my faith in a way to get God to love me. Friends, we don't do that. That's not our faith. People accuse us of that all the time. But we'll get, to, we'll get to why they do it in our second reading. But we have to remember, the people that, that Peter was talking to were people who were, they were pretty lost because they had tried over and over and over again to keep the law and they'd failed. And they had violated the covenant that God made with them and, and they were oppressed, they were exiled, they were always getting defeated. Like They, they were in trouble. And, and what Peter's saying is, look, Turn from your sin, and Christ is going to grant you something that you could never achieve on your own, which is peace with God. The times of refreshing, that's important. I know some of you, you, you need to understand that because maybe you've lived your life up to this point focused on yourself, focused on trying to keep all the rules and do everything perfectly and, and trying to understand everything perfectly, and it's just exhausting, isn't it? It's just exhausting, but you've missed the point of who Jesus is and what he wants to you. You know, following Jesus is hard, but it's also refreshing, isn't it? Because it unlocks grace and grace comes to us and, and grace is like healing medicine on an open wound. And that's what refreshing means, be, to be restored, to be strengthened and to be reconciled, to be brought back, right? 
That's the ministry of the gospel. And if you've lived your life far from God, if you've lived your life just focused on practicing a religion, but far from a relationship with Jesus, then when you come into that place where you do experience that and you recognize his, his love for you and, and what he's done for you and how his resurrection brings you life, it's incredibly refreshing. And we need that. We need that. Okay, let's look at our responsorial psalm, Psalm 4. Lord, let your face shine on us. Answer me when I call, O God, of my right. Thou hast given me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Lord, let your face shine on us. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Lord, let your face shine on us. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Lift up the light of thy countenance upon us, O Lord. Lord, let your face shine on us. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep, for thou alone, O Lord, makest me dwell in safety. Our second reading comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. St. John writes these words, My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly love for God is perfected. By this, we may be sure that we are in him. All right, my friends. Now, this is powerful stuff here. First of all, the recognition that the will of God is that we don't sin. That's the will of God. That's what the whole purpose of this is, that we remain pure, that we keep ourselves free from sin. But if anyone does sin... And you know, I think you could say, you know, I think that St. John was being pretty kind here. When we sin, because we're all going to, so he would also be the, the one who would say, if we say we have no sin, we make him out to be a liar. We, you know, when we sin, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And, and, and that's Christ. Friends, he has made expiation for our sins and for the whole world. I love that he says that, not just for us, but for the whole world. Again, he's, he's expanding this view of who God has come to save, not just for certain people, not just for the special group, friends, but for everyone. Salvation is available to everyone because God loves everyone and he's made the way for all. But what does that look like? How do we live in that? How do we receive that? Of course, we see what Peter said. What did he say? Repent. You've got to change your life. Sometimes we've seen the gospel reduced to just believing a, a truth about something, an intellectual assent to the truth about who Jesus is, and that's it. We have a lot of arguments with people about this because people will say, no, it's salvation by faith alone. You don't have to do anything. You're saved by what you, what you believe. Well, the book of James tells us that even the demons believe and shudder. There, there are so many passages, including this one, that talk about, look, if you say you love Jesus, if you claim to have that belief, but you don't obey his commands, you're a liar. You're a liar. So there should be no space. And this shouldn't be a big theological argument, in my opinion, even if you don't believe in Catholicism. I think that there shouldn't be this, this argument against obedience, the, the need for it. But yet, sadly, there is. And, and, and I understand what people are trying to do and say, well, you know, you're not saved by what you do, but it, 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 it just, doesn't, just doesn't work. It's not biblical. Friends, repentance is, is an act that we do. Faith in God is a gift, and our response to it, that's, that's what we're required to bring to the table. And, and, and the ante is upped here by saying, look, you got to keep his commands. You've got to do it. Our faith must dictate our life. We can't say we have the faith if we don't live it. So avoid the temptation to downplay obedience. People will do that on both sides. Some people will say, oh, I really think we should be obedient to God, but man, it's just too hard. I can't do it. Good thing God gives me grace, you know. Other people say, no, you don't have to do anything. Just believe. And, and even if you kind of believe that sort of in your mind, I don't know why you would go around preaching to people that it's unnecessary to be obedient to what Jesus says. Now, I get it if you say, well, I don't want to do what the church tells me to do or whatever, because some people make that distinction, you know, but, but I think that that's a bad distinction. I think that Jesus speaks to us through his church and in his church. 
And yet people will argue that you don't even need to do what he says in the Bible. You just need to do what this part is, right? Believe. Friends, don't be swayed by that. Understand what we're called to, but also understand that if you don't do it perfectly, you have an advocate. And that's important too, because it can be so easy for us to leave that time of refreshing behind because we get so scrupulous or we get so uh, filled with shame for how we failed. If, if and when you fail, recognize the sacrament of confession is there for you to help get you back on your feet. Don't be slow in that and, and just repent. That's, that's the point. So don't feel like you're excluded and don't feel like it doesn't matter what you do. I think that's the point here. Okay, let's look at our, our gospel today. And I love this. This is, this is what happens after, after um, Jesus is resurrected and he has walked the road to Emmaus with these, with these disciples and they're like blown away. Look at this from Luke 24. It says, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Remember, remember they didn't know who he was. They're walking with him and he's teaching, talking about them. And they're like, you don't know who all the, Jesus is, all this, but they don't recognize him until he goes with them and then he celebrates the Eucharist with them. And then now, boom, their eyes are opened, right? As they were saying this, Jesus himself, Jesus himself stood among them, but they were startled and frightened and supposed that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questionings rise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. And while they still disbelieved for joy and wondered, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is what he said would happen. This is what was the plan. This is how it goes. This is the message of the gospel, repentance and forgiveness of sins, right? This is, a, this is what it's about. And yet oftentimes what we see are, are people that want to hijack that gospel message with their social cause, with their issues about what they think is important or their pet theology or whatever. And I've even seen people in, in, in liberal Protestant circles deny the physical bodily resurrection. They want to say, well, you know, we don't necessarily need to hold to that as a, a, a um, you know, requirement of the faith. I mean, I've, I've heard that. And the, the scriptures make no room for that, my friends. Why would anybody disbelieve that? It's because they lack the faith in their own heart. And, and, and they don't want to believe that. Why? Because it's too good to be true. See, that's what these guys were dealing with. Even as he said this, they were like, they disbelieved. They, they, they struggled. Oh, it says they said over joy, right? And, and, and that is powerful, isn't it? Basically what that means is they thought it was too good to be true. Even though he's standing right there in front of them, he's showing them, look, Here's the proof. I'm right here. You can touch me. I'll eat some food. You can see a spirit has not flesh and bones. He wants to leave no room for any other interpretation than the fact that he physically rose from the grave. Friends, we have all sorts of, of recognition of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And you know, disbelieving for joy is, is kind of a weird thing, isn't it? Because it's this, it's this idea that, well, man, it's just too good to be true. And then Jesus teaches a Bible study. I love that. Man, wouldn't it have been awesome to have more of that? Come on. Come on, Luke. Tell us what he said. Show us. Give us the, de give us the details, man. You know? How cool would that have been to be able to see how Jesus connects all those things? He's having his own unpacking the mass right there. And he connects everything. Just like St. Peter was doing at Pentecost. Jesus is doing there. You know? Where do you think Peter learned it? And this is the message that we all have to understand. Everything that we've ever been taught through the scriptures, it all points to this reality of who Jesus is, his resurrection power, and our need for repentance and what that leads to, my friends. A time of refreshing, a time of rest, a time of renewal, a time of recognizing that, yes, God is that good. He can call the worst sinner and turn him into a saint. He can take someone who's so far from him that the rest of the world would say, how is this even possible? Like St. Paul. 
and turn him into an incredible apostle if only he would repent. Friends, there's nothing that God can't do through you if you would turn to him and repent and allow his grace to wash over your life. And then look at this. You know, last week we talked about um, what it means, or two weeks we talked about this whole idea of, of labor not in vain. Remember when we talked about in Easter how, how we saw this thing that, that your labor is not in vain if you're focused on the resurrection? The labor of Peter and the disciples continues to, to bear fruit for 2,000 years because it was God's plan. And if God has a plan for you, and he does, then the more you live into it, the more you let your plan disappear into his plan, then everything you do will draw other people to him. That time of refreshing will be, well, it, it'll, it'll correspond to a time of great activity and a time of great suffering oftentimes too. But what's beautiful about our faith is that we can have both. We can have the, the, the difficulties and the sufferings, but yet at the same time, be refreshed by the power of God. Friends, what does that look like for you? Where in your life do you need to hear this message? Where in your life are you still disbelieving even for joy? You're like, yeah, that's so awesome for them. But what about me? God couldn't possibly do that in my life. Have you ever looked at somebody and thought, man, I wish I could just be half as holy as they are or half as devoted to their faith as they are. I could never do that or whatever. I could never be as smart as they are. You know what? You're not called to be other people, but make no mistake about it. If, if you truly give yourself over to the Lord and turn from your sin and, and trust in the Lord completely and follow him, the, the sky's the limit on what can happen. He will transform you. That's the beautiful thing about our faith. It's not just about, all right, I got the right things down in my brain. I understand the right truth and I have the right belief. I checked all the boxes. That's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. What comes next is an incredible time of refreshing. Turn to the Lord, my friend, and experience that for yourself. And this year will be incredible. I think that there's a powerful thing coming with this for a lot of us and with unpacking the mass. I think that God is doing something amazing in this. And I'm so thankful that you're a part of it. And, and how amazing is it to see people that are, are experiencing the word of God in their life and, and going to mass going, wow, this has never made more sense to me. This is the stuff that I'm hearing from you guys. It's so, it's so incredible. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to, to do this. It, it, it's, it, it's the same for me every single week when I go through this and work on it. I, you know, really unpacking the mass is just an exercise I do that I happen to do in front of a camera. Um, but this is something that we should be doing and studying the scriptures. And maybe you have like three or four other different things that you do with that. That's pr Praise the Lord for that. You can never do too much, my friends. But I want to just thank you for taking this time to be here with me. And I really do look forward to being back here with you next week. Let someone else know. Share this with someone and uh, spread the word so that more people can unpack the mask just like we are. Thank you so much for being here, my friends. Look forward to being back here with you next week. Take care and God bless.